Well, what, a, what an awful, awful thing to see. But we're here to learn, so we'll move on. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 363, first week of February of 2024. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about. And as always, so many things we cannot talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. I was uh, I was trying to think today about how many of these episodes we've done in uh, almost in uh, about almost ten years here, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, in my uh, sleep addled brain state, I came up with uh, seven per year, and that is uh, <laughs> that is incorrect. <laughs> I'm not a. I did not uh, major in math mathematics. Yes, mathematicianing. But yes. I, I believe there may need to be some additional calculations made. Yeah, I'll, I'll revisit that. <laughs> well, it's another banner week for the World Wrestling Federation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So WWE had Royal Rumble uh, this past weekend, a show that was long. And uh, overshadowed by everything happening in the company uh, that is not wrestling. So, Vince McMahon resigned uh, last Friday during SmackDown. (laughs) He's no longer the executive chairman of the board of directors for TKO. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dwayne Johnson is uh, cutting him out of all the photos that he's posting (laughs) on social media this week. (laughs) Of uh, Dwayne with his glasses on at uh, the stock market Mm -hmm. (laughs) doing a business last week. (laughs) Um, Vince has said he's uh, still denies everything in the lawsuit, but he's going to step down because he owes it to the WWE universe (laughs) and to the uh, to the company. Oh man, the only. comment publicly from a TKO TKO executive to this point has been WWE's chief content officer Paul Triple H Levesque Mm -hmm. was asked head on about Vince in uh, his post Royal Rumble press conference a thing that literally no one is making WWE do (laughs) and I don't know why they do them I don't know why they do these press conferences uh, they're not especially helpful for anyone. And uh, Triple H uh, gave a very bad performance at this press conference on Saturday after the Royal Rumble. And um, I'll touch on that in a second. Um, Vince McMahon's uh, the plaintiff in the, in the Vince lawsuit says there are more people in the company willing to testify as to the culture that is going on there. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Laurinaitis has spoken up through his lawyer and said that he's a victim in all of this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, Shawn Michaels gave a uh, uh, better than Triple H answer when asked about... uh, (laughs) Asked about some stuff today on an NXT NXT media call. A lot of not wrestling to talk about <laughs> right off the bat with the Vince stuff. Uh, Vince resigned. Are you surprised? Um, I mean a little bit because, like, on I don't know if it was Thursday night after we recorded or Friday morning. Uh, I think it's uh, Brandon Thurston at WrestleNomics pointed out in like the way TKO's bylaws were written, they could not fire him. He had to be the one to step down. And I, and I don't know if that would hold up if you're like actively harming the company. I'm sh- You would think everything would be subject to some kind of morals clause. But I guess I, I guess I wanted to I thought maybe he would try to hold out given that he the story is that the first time he stepped down, he almost immediately regretted it and forced his way back in and the rest is history. 
So I guess maybe I was surprised to see him shuffle out the door so quickly. Um, but also sponsors were pulling out. <laughs> Uh, Slim Jim announced they were pulling out, gave statements to the press saying that it was because of the Vince McMahon story that they were pulling out. Um, I, and I think, I don't know if any other sponsor gave a statement, but I think it was talked about that there were other people getting antsy. Uh, so I think that kind of, once the sponsor starts pulling out, I mean, if if he didn't resign, Nick Khan would have just kicked him out the... <laughs> kicked him out the window and and uh and dealt with it that way like it was once once the sponsors start pulling their money um that seems like a a point of no return i think so i guess that's in the end that's that's how this chapter of the Vince McMahon story ended it's not because the company rose up to discipline him for his wrongdoings it's because, as as is always the case with this sort of thing, it's because he was starting to hurt the bottom line. And that's why he was out the door. And the company would obviously very much like that to be the end of the negative press. They would very much like it to be the one bad apple is gone and now everything is sunshine and lollipops. But uh, it certainly doesn't seem like that's the case. And... Uh, as you touched on, Paul Levesque and later this or earlier in the the day on Thursday when we're recording this, Shawn Michaels were asked to name specific ways that the company is putting in any sort of safeguards to protect people uh, in these sorts of situations from this situation ever happening again. And neither of them could give any specifics. So... Uh, that's not great considering this story is now a week old and you can't, and you, I would assume pay your PR people a lot of money and they couldn't give you anything to say to the, to say when you know, you're going to be asked about it. That doesn't, uh, that's not great for, that's not a good look on a moral level or on just like a basic competency level, is it? No, and it it led me to ask the question, do you think that um, Nick Khan was letting uh, Triple H um, uh, hoist himself on his own petard uh, uh, at the press conference last Saturday? Like, TKO is a... I looked this up last week. I forget what it is. If they have a $14 billion market cap or something... Mm-hmm. It's like it's a big company, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Ari Emanuel is the CEO, and uh, Ari Emanuel is the CEO of Endeavor, also, and um, they're a much bigger company than Endeavor, which is like the real Hollywood company, right? Um, so on the one hand, you could say, well, the company CEO is way too busy to get involved in uh, this wrestling stuff, and. Uh, and and doesn't need to address the media about it. On the other hand, Nick Khan's the company president, mm-hmm. and uh, and if he's too busy to talk about wrestling on a Saturday night to the press, I I don't know what I don't know what's going on. I know Nick was there. I knew Nick was sure at was. the uh, Nick was at the Royal Rumble merchandise store on Friday night taking pictures with fans while uh, Vince McMahon was resigning. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a very... Oh, sorry, continue. No, no. So I was just going to wrap that up by saying big company, uh, smart business people running it, uh, savvy business people running it. Maybe you don't want the first public comment from an executive in the company about this to be uh, from the meathead. uh, (laughs) From the meathead. And uh, maybe Nick Khan at the very least Nick Khan or preferably Ari Emanuel, a very smooth, uh, polished speaker who I'm sure has a lot of experience in handling crises Mm. should be the first executive to comment on this publicly, unless they're just trying to get uh, triple Paul out of there 
and uh, Brian Gortz is going to be running WWE Creative uh, sometime within the next year. You know, that was my takeaway. It's like, okay, we're going to let this guy prove that he's incompetent by by uh, botching this press conference, and then uh, we'll get him out of there. And then, well, he might be one of the unnamed executives in uh, in this lawsuit anyway, and uh, that might work itself out. So it might be bye-bye, Paul, and it might be uh, hello, Brian Gortz. Yeah, that, <laughs> that makes as much sense as anything, um, as I think everyone who watched or read what he said at that press conference, the fact that he didn't have any kind of prepared statement Yes. Uh, well, he had a prepared statement. He had a very long and rambling prepared statement, but not one that included even mentioning or alluding to the Vince stuff. So, yeah. So let me just break in here quickly and say that what we're talking about how Triple H botched this press conference and not mm-hmm. specifically mentioning how he botched the press conference. And it True. was like <laughs> he was asked questions about Vince directly. And he was like, uh, well, I don't want to focus on that. I just want to focus on the positives this week where my father-in-law was uh, (laughs) accused of sex trafficking was a Mm -hmm. great week for the company. Yes. And uh, no, I haven't read the lawsuit was pretty much the only thing close to a comment specifically about Vince that they could. uh, And they look, they also asked him the question, what kind of safeguards will the company put in to uh, ensure that something like this never gets, it never happens again and he is anything and everything anything and everything no i haven't read the lawsuit anything and everything it's okay well he uh he that's how he screwed up the press conference correct yes and yes he had a a long rambling opening statement about the netflix deal and the rumble and the records they set and the attendance and the revenue from the live gate and all of that and then uh yeah, and then he did everything that you just said. So it was just a terrible performance. Uh, about, I think, three people asked about it of the six questions or whatever that he took. Other people asked if this era is better than the Attitude Era. <laughs> that person should be shot out of a cannon. Uh, no, I. it was... It, it was a very odd and uncomfortable thing to watch. Uh, and yes, at the end of it, I uh, I didn't necessarily make the Brian Gerwitz connection with, with Dwayne now being on the board. But saying that, they would theoretically already have a guy ready to plug and play when it comes to that role, who has been at the top level of WWE television production for many years, but who hasn't been with the company over the last decade during the timeline and certainly not during the timeline of all of this horrific stuff that is named, at least in this particular lawsuit. And yeah, it it does raise the question. If not, if that wasn't what was happening, uh, I just, like I said, I can't, it's one of those things where you can't believe a company that is this, as you pointed out, they make a lot of money. They're worth a lot of money. We know they got marketing people. We know they got PR people. And Paul's out there talking about how it's a great week and he wants to focus on the positives. Um, is It's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable that that, was, that it happened. And to your point, why did they even have this press conference? Like, it wouldn't have been good if he just said no comment, but he actively made the decision worse. And there were a lot of headlines that I don't know would have been written in the way they were written from like real news places. Yes. The day after with the headline, Paul Levesque says week where Vince McMahon ousted for sex trafficking lawsuit was great. Yes. Like that, that was the tone of all the headlines that were written about this. And it definitely gave a little extra fuel on the fire of the story when maybe by the end of the weekend, the mainstream media would have gotten bored because it's just wrestling, which tends to happen with this sort of thing a lot. Yes. Um, So just just an all-time blunder. And yes, you would have to think somebody there, whether it's Nick Khan, whether it's Ari Emanuel, somebody wants that guy gone because otherwise, why would you let him go out there and do that? I, I, I don't know. 
I don't know. It was a baff. It was a baffling performance. And look, Triple H, uh, the television performer, very funny guy. Hmm. Um, I've enjoyed a lot of things that Triple H has done over the years. I'm I'm not out to get Triple H on television. <laughs> yes, uh, that's an important clarification. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm not out to get Triple H. Uh, mm-hmm. um, I am a little bit. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> you have specific thoughts about um, his his constitution. <laughs> oh, <laughs> am I allowed to say it? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay, he's a weak hearted bitch. Um, and yeah, I have always had a very specific view of him. <laughs> And maybe some of that's informed by my, you know, viewing of him as a television character. Maybe I'm a, a little bit of a mark in that way. He could say that if you want to. But uh, yeah, I think he's he has never struck me as a guy who uh, is particularly smart. He's just good <laughs> at sticking around and <laughs> attaching himself to the right people. And that's not a that skill is not like not valuable, right? Like well, for self preservation. Like right. I don't know. Of being a successful person in like business financially, that's that's a valuable skill. So kudos to the man in that way. But I've no, I don't have a lot of respect for him as a person, <laughs> and Jeez. it's going, it's getting lower. There's the the bottom is dropping out. Um. So we'll see. Uh, you know, as for now, he's still running TV, and I, I guess he's doing it by himself because I hear I hear old Bruce is uh, taking a page out of Vince's book and getting the surgery right when the the water's getting a little hot. Bruce uh, Bruce Pritchard is in fact uh, on medical leave again. Uh, Bruce Pritchard for a guy who is uh... <laughs> for a guy who's shaped like a a croissant. <laughs> he uh has had surgery on both rotator rotator cuffs mm. and uh is ha- having surgery on his triceps <laughs> the same week that CM Punk is having surgery on his triceps. Just, just laid up just laid up next to each other. <laughs> Tough um, week. <clears throat> Unbelievable there. We sh- speaking of Bruce, it may also be worth mentioning that on uh, I believe Saturday afternoon of this week. Uh, Ronda Rousey, <laughs> out of nowhere, <laughs> off tweeted, the top rope. <laughs> yes, tweeted that as long as Bruce Pritchard is in power, has any position of power, Vince's influence will still be on the show because that's how Vince was running TV when he was gone before was through Bruce Pritchard. So that's a pretty strong uh, alle- allegation. <laughs> she used the phrase "Bruce is Vince's avatar." <laughs> right. <laughs> she. Yeah, she really didn't mince words. And, uh, you know. Well, you know what words triggered her, right? Yes. (laughs) She is the first uh, conservative in recent memory to actually go after a real uh, sex trafficker. So she's made history once again. Allegedly, yes. Uh, Yeah. So a lot of talk here. Uh, Let's just wrap up all the lawsuit talk while Mm -hmm. we can. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Not... Sean got asked about a Brutus Beefcake shoot interview in his uh, his call. Yeah, he was saying that uh, Brutus accused uh, Sean and Marty of doing some non-consensual things over the years. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sean very specifically uh, addressed, <laughs> addressed those claims. Addressed Big Brother Booty. By saying that uh, th- those aren't true. Brutus has uh, walked those comments back before, um, and he said he has made mistakes in the past, but he had never done anything that wasn't consensual, and that people who engage in non-consensual behavior typically have issues with power and women, which he never experienced. What a weird thing to say. (laughs) I, I don't know, man. Uh... If, I don't, if I don't it ends know. with nothing ever happened, the, that's all you say. <laughs> you don't need to like psychoanalyze alleged 
sex crimes on the end there. Well, he says, uh, he also said the transparency and openness have changed everything about how they train people at NXT. Treating people with love and respect isn't hard to do, and he wants to foster that environment. He says there were policies updated in 2022 to help make it a safer environment. Unfortunately, he couldn't recall any of them. But he didn't didn't need to refer to a piece of paper with these policies to make the the performance center a safe environment, especially given that uh, his own daughter visits him at work every week. Mm. Um, Sidebar to this discussion, just just randomly thinking about something. Um, Terry Taylor still work there? Uh, He sure does. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Interesting. All right. Continue. Um, the phrase a direct quote from Sean here is everyone is excited about the future Uh, that's not a direct quote Um, despite the Vincent Mann situation quote the windows have opened up and everyone is ready to move forward the windows have opened up that's not a phrase (laughs) I, I like Sean I like Sean he was on my Mount Rushmore for many many years Mm-hmm. Uh, before he was replaced by uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, just uh, not not a good week for uh, the DX boys at press conferences. Yes, I just it was it was, and I'm sure many people made this point. But the idea that when you looked at it, comparatively, Sean is lucky he went second because comparatively, he definitely had the better answers to the questions. And he was asked more questions than Triple H was somehow. Yes. Um, but uh, again, he, he he's fortunate to be able to compare his answers to the ones given a few nights earlier by Paul Levesque, for sure. As someone who likes Sean, mm-hmm. I can say I think his intentions here are good. Mm-hmm. I think he's just not how do you not give so, a like a vice president in the company who's going to speak to the public and to the media? How do you not prepare him for every possible question that he would be asked? <laughs> right. Especially when the ones that he fumbled on a little bit were ones that had already been asked of a company executive already in the last few days. Um. But- Utterly bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> Utterly bizarre week, unless there are people higher up than Sean and Hunter who don't particularly want Sean and Hunter around anymore. Perhaps a guy who, when he made his autobiographical television show, uh, pretended Sean Michaels never existed and made up a character that did all of the bad things that Sean Michaels did to Dwayne Johnson, for instance. Yeah, named like uh, uh, Chad Frost, I think, or something, or mm-hmm. Chili McPhrase, or whatever you call it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Anyway, so uh, wrapping up the lawsuit talk here, uh, John Laurinaitis is a lawyer, says that his client is a victim of Vince McMahon. Mm. So the lawyer released a statement to Vice Media on Thursday, said that like the plaintiff, Mr. Laurinaitis is a victim in this case, not a predator. The truth will come out. Yeah. That... Quote, quote. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Read the allegations. Read the federal statute. Power control, employment supervisory capacity, dictatorial sexual demands with repercussions if not met. Count how many times that the complaint Vince exerts control over both of them. Okay, then now I'm done. Yeah, I was just going to say there is... The language in that statement from Laurinaitis' lawyer where it promises to defend him and that maybe all of the accusations aren't entirely, uh, in their view, how it happened, but also at the same time sort of corroborating other parts of, uh, of, the, of the claims because they're talking about how old Johnny Ace was just a victim, like just like this woman. So... Um... Yeah, this is, uh, I don't know. I guess it's kind of funny that after all this time, Vince and Johnny Ace are going to, are, are maybe going to be, tur- are going to turn on each other in a court of law. Um, if we're hoping that there's 
more dirty laundry to be exhumed from all of this uh, than the less that Vince and Laurenitis are coordinating, probably the better chance you have of getting somewhere with some of this. I, sp- I suppose. I-, I don't really know what to say about any of that. Um, really bad week. Real, really bad week in wrestling. Uh, hopefully, leads to some uh, to some good things down the road. Uh, Royal Rumble. Uh, CM Punk uh, tore his triceps in the uh, in the Royal Rumble match itself, mm-hmm. and got thrown out last by Cody Rhodes, who won the second his second consecutive Royal Rumble, and uh, after a very long show. Uh, Cody Rhodes uh, has yet to decide which championship he's going to go after at WrestleMania, but they threw kind of a monkey wrench into the uh, plans on Raw on Monday. A little red herring, maybe, making you think that uh, where Seth Rollins said that Cody wants the blue collar title, the working man's title, the American dream title, not the Hulk Hogan title. (laughs) <laughs> and uh and should challenge him at WrestleMania. And Cody said that he'll think about it. And uh Cody's gonna be on SmackDown this week and maybe he'll give an answer to what uh title he's gonna go after at WrestleMania. Bailey will be on SmackDown this week. She won the women's Royal Rumble and she will announce which title she's going after on SmackDown this week. So your Royal Rumble winners, Cody Rhodes and Bailey. And uh, CM Punk tore his triceps. And uh, I sent you a message at 11.42 p.m. on Saturday night saying, I think Phil might have tore his triceps. He's holding the back of his arm and he's talking to the ref forever. And uh, we found out the next day, Phil tore his triceps. Sure did. Uh, Yeah, great. Great call by you. Uh, (laughs) As we always say, one of us is always (laughs) one of us is always right. Yes. And you called it immediately. Um, but yeah, a right, tough break. Not, to, I'm not, not blaming the guy, but it's absolutely gigantic. He's enormous. He's never <laughs> looked this big ever, specifically in his arms. When and... he, when he first came to the main roster on ECW TV or whatever, mm-hmm. and he was, I don't know how tall a guy is. He's, he's like somewhere between 5'11 and 6'1. We're, I'm, obsessed with how tall he actually is but he was like trying to be as big as possible so that they would take him seriously on Mm -hmm. the main roster and he was maybe 240 pounds uh i don't think he's 240 now but he's uh more muscular yes (laughs) he is the biggest you've ever seen him (laughs) and he is uh, on the wrong side of 40 (laughs) Uh, and he has now had his second tricep tear in two years. Um, yeah, it is, it is the other arm, I think. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, bummer, bummer for him, bummer for I'm sure him and Seth or whoever he was. I assume that's the direction they were going for Mania. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a bummer for for those guys. It's it's something to. I guess strive for it's an it's something you can build next year's show around now, uh, assuming he's still around in a year, which I think he will be. <laughs> I think he will be. Um, he's on his best behavior now. It is his last chance, right? There aren't any places left to go that will pay him <laughs> over a million dollars a year, <laughs> right? He's um, got that 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 whole half a block in Chicago that he owns. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's got a and a very nice house in Los Angeles that he's mm-hmm. got a. He's got to pay for. Mm -hmm. So, hey, uh, look, he'll have some time at home and he could spend it with his wife and and dog. So uh, anyway, or or he could spend it in Orlando. (laughs) He could be rehabbing rehabbing the injury with a lot of 24 year old women who look like younger versions of his wife. And as you pointed out, maybe they should all just rent a beach house together to save money. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I just. I want everyone to be frugal. Um, you know, there's word there that, you know, Phil's finances aren't what they once were. I, I'm just worried about the guy. I want to make sure he's being uh, being smart with his money. 
So oh. JC Jane, Roxanne Perez, uh, Cora Jade. And also Phil. rehabbing. Going to see a lot of Phil in the Performance Center, I'm sure, over the next six months. In uh, in a beach house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, great. Makes sense to me. Um, no, I mean, yeah, it, it sucks for him. It did lead to, in my opinion, the best promo Drew McIntyre has cut in his entire career on Raw on Monday. You're very much not a Drew fan. No, I'm going not. back going back many years on this program. I did very cruelly name him Mr. Excitement <laughs> at one point on this show. Uh but I think he's done I think he's doing I think overall, I think I've said some nice things about him when he was working with Seth over over December too. But yeah, I think this past week I thought was his best his best mic work ever. And it also is an interesting bit because as far as we know, and this was somewhat co- corroborated by, I know Dave Meltzer talked about it. I don't know if anyone else has gone on the record. Um, as far as we know, Drew is not re-signed. And if Punk is gone for the next six months, that would put us past when Drew was leaving, if he were to leave. So certainly seems like the company thinks Drew is coming back, even if he hasn't put pen to paper yet. So Punk tore the tricep, taking the uh, Future Shock DDT. Mm-hmm. From Drew, and then on Raw they set up uh, Drew as Drew. Drew said, "I'm not a spiritual man. I don't really know what I believe in, but I prayed for this, and it happened. <laughs> and it was I tackled out loud. And the crowd like, gasped. <laughs> like <laughs> I tackled. I don't know the last time I laughed out loud at a line in a promo. Um, but yeah, they." It, Punk said that uh, he was going to go after Drew when he came back. And uh, then Drew stomped on his arm some, some more. And uh, Sami Zayn saved. And Sami Zayn and CM Punk being aligned is very, very funny. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So if you watch the TV on Monday, you would think, well, S- Drew McIntyre's resigned. And maybe Drew McIntyre is going to get Punk spot now against Seth at Mania, even though they mm-hmm. just did that match a bunch of times. Um, maybe he's he's gets that spot now, and uh, as soon as Punk comes back, he'll be uh, wrestling Drew. But Drew's contract's up sometime over the summer, and uh, Drew McIntyre loves leaking things to the media almost as much as CM Punk does. So I would think. <laughs> I would think if Drew had re-signed that Dave Meltzer would have had that answer and he said the opposite. So I would think that he could get an answer from Drew directly on that question if he needed to. Yeah, which makes it all the more interesting. Like I said, unless unless the company has a verbal assurance that Drew is, is sticking around. <laughs> Um, which was which was kind of the semantics with uh, when a couple of months ago when everybody was go- going with well Co- Cody's resigned and then Cody's like no I haven't resigned it's mm-hmm. like well okay you've agreed to terms we're just working on the final language and right. yada 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 like it, it could be that kind of situation we don't know for sure so uh, but either way it did it did set up a big match for Punk when he comes back, theoretically. And it also, in the meantime, it helps Drew, who was looking like a guy who was going to end up in, like, a multi-man ladder match or something at WrestleMania. Sure. Is maybe going to get, you know, a... I don't think he and Seth would mean event, uh, unless they really light the world on fire over the next couple of months, but... Uh, you know, could have a big, big marquee match at WrestleMania for the, you know, in a singles match for the titles. So it's, it's definitely helping Drew's career uh, by far. Um, so good, good way of trying to make lemon, uh, you know, lemonade out of lemons. And uh, yeah, so good for Drew and uh, tough for Phil, but he'll be back. And then, yeah, you're, the other thing you mentioned from Raw, the only other thing really worth talking about is the, uh, the Cody Seth promo, uh, which I love that. Uh, because uh, writers who use subtext are cowards, as we all know. Sure. Uh, while uh, Seth is cutting his passionate promo about how it's the blue collar worker title, uh, he's wearing a literal blue collar. 
Well, there you go. There you Uh, go. I don't know. I thought it was a nerd ass promo (laughs) when he's talking about, oh, you don't want the the politics title. What does that mean? What does that mean within the fictional world of wrestling? How did Hulk Hogan politic himself into the WWF championship, which he held for four years? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Hate that I, stuff. I know you're not a Seth guy either. No, it it made it worse because Seth was the one saying it. But I just thought it was <laughs> such. It's just it's a line that is designed for people like us. Yes, who spend all day every day thinking about and talking about wrestling. Yes, and it made me mad because <laughs> regular people don't care about that line. I mean, I guess they can. I guess that sort of line is so like has been so ingrained into wrestling over the last 25 to 30 years that maybe, maybe that is an exciting line for regular rank and file WWE fans now too. But I just, I just, just hated it. It doesn't make any sense within the the confines of the show. It's like, Oh, he politicked his way to win this fake belt, but you should try to win this real belt that I have. What? It was also a, a strange uh, drive-by on Hogan, given that Hogan was like the voiceover guy for the <laughs> yes. Royal Rumble the night before. <laughs> yes, he's the leg- he's the legend of all legends, celebrating forty years of Hulkamania, and also <laughs> he's a phony politician who 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 tricked his way in the fake world of wrestling to get the belt that he didn't deserve, I guess. Like it might be a little awkward the next time those guys see each other, but I don't not confident that Hulk watches I, Raw every week. I was gonna say and 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 like Seth couldn't get through Hulk's entourage anyway. <laughs> no, that's... Not, not knobs and Jimmy Hart aren't letting Seth get within fifteen <laughs> feet of <laughs> Uh, what do you know about that? So Bailey uh, came out on Raw. Was going to announce uh, which whether. So she said all along she's going to challenge Rhea Ripley. When obviously that's not the match. Mm-hmm. And um, then Nia Jax came out and tried to intimidate her into choosing someone else. And Bailey said, "Well, actually, yeah, maybe I will be intimidated, and I'll." Uh, so maybe we're going to get the big damage control horseman beat down on uh, Bailey on SmackDown this Friday. We'll find out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's coming. We all know it's coming. It's just a matter of do they want to do it now or do they want to do it after the Chamber show, I guess. But I would think that whatever they're going to do at the Chamber show is going to set up Rhea's opponent, one would think. Yes. Since Bailey won the... the so maybe you need to do it now to to then make a chamber match. That's a number one contender match for, for Rhea's belt. Yeah. So that will, um, that will play out on WWE television. This, Mm -hmm. uh, this, this Friday on SmackDown. Um, moving along to AEW. Mm -hmm. They're loading up dynamite for next week. Their debut, I believe, in the Phoenix market at uh, the big arena in Phoenix after a couple of weeks of disappointing uh, attendance totals in the uh, mid south and southeast of the United States. Yeah. Um, dynamite this week uh, sure was a program. Uh, Rob Van Dam wrestled Swerve Strickland in a hardcore match in the main event. Mm-hmm. John Moxley and Jeff Hardy wrestled in the opener. Um, Wardlow may have torn his meniscus. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Excitement Wardlow may uh, may be on the shelf for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Blackpool Combat Club are uh, feuding with CMLL for some reason. And uh, next week's Dynamite is the one that has the loaded up lineup, though, with um, a big Tony Khan announcement, Mm -hmm. uh, Swerve Strickland versus Hangman Page in a number one contenders match. The winner fights Samoa Joe at Revolution. The tag title match with Big Bill and Ricky Starks defending against Sting and Darby Allin. Chris Jericho versus Takeshita. And uh, the Blackpool Combat Club versus CMLL. So they're loading up next week, and Tony Khan has a big announcement for next week, which 
I know what it is, but I can't say it on the air. <laughs> oh, you're doing one of those. I have to do one of those. That's fair. I was threatened. I was threatened today. <laughs> <laughs> They'll know it was you. If, if it, yes, if it's out there, anyway. they will. They will specifically come after me. <laughs> Maybe for my job. <laughs> gotcha. But I, I, but I know something. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, and I shoot don't know so. <laughs> All right. uh, obviously, the rumor, which is public, and we can talk mm-hmm. about this, that you have not, yes. you have not told me anything about. This is a public thing. Many people have said, correct, is that it will be related to Mercedes Monet's uh, impending debut in this company sometime in March, when they may or may not have a Boston date that they haven't announced yet. That is a public rumor. That is a public rumor. And uh, yeah, so that would obviously be newsworthy. And (laughs) yeah, it is interesting how much they're loading up that show. Um, We talked about this again, nothing, 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 uh, it's (laughs) nothing bad (laughs) and not about the rumor that you that you know that I don't know. But we were discussing just amongst ourselves in our own philosophy. (laughs) Would you announce her ahead of time? Would you debut her as a surprise? Her and Okada in this case, if he, if in fact he is coming in, which is an, is also not confirmed as of now, um, or would you maybe try to do a, a la Phil Brooks debut, a a hint at it for a while, see how the tickets go, and then either announce it if you need to sell more tickets or if you don't need to sell more tickets. You literally don't say until she, she walks out. And... I, 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 no, I am. Uh, I am in a uh, Mercedes money group chat mm-hmm. for for stands. I uh, that Mercedes is occasionally in. Mm-hmm. I um, I like to tell a funny story about that too. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let me get on the air with it before I tell that story. Um, um, I don't know that you're gonna sell out a building ahead of a uh, sell out a large building doing a first dance kind of thing with with her. Maybe you will. I pray I'm wrong. I don't know that you're gonna do that. Yeah. But hey, it would be a nice way to um say this is the biggest women's division free agent signing we've ever had absolutely um and yeah so i guess that's that's kind of the excitement is not a lot of reporters uh well-known wrestling reporters sean ross sap andrew zarian are speaking about it in a way that makes you feel like it's definitely happening uh that she's coming in yes but uh that. Uh, the how and the when is is still uh, yet to be determined. So certainly one would think next week on this show, which they are really loading up, as you mentioned, as you laid out the, the lineup there. Um, that's, that's a good way to get people talking. And uh, another thing to keep in mind, again, not related to anything, you know, for a fact <laughs> uh, that we talked about. Tony loves a double debut, doesn't he? He does. He's done this before with Adam Cole and Brian Danielson. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps other examples I can't think of at the moment. That <laughs> they tried to do it. Well, I guess they did do it, but uh, they were. Uh, it was supposed to be in Buffalo in front of his hometown, but they were supposed to reveal Brody Lee and I believe Matt Hardy on the same night. What a, ah, right. What a great one punch and a, <laughs> also a second punch. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's 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 the story, and I guess they did end up doing that that night. I think they did debut them on the same night. It was just in a in in Daly's place with no fans in Jacksonville. Yeah. So, um, but yes, Tony Tony likes a double debut. He likes to to uh, to throw it all at you at once. And hey, we just we just saw how well a double debut can can work in other companies too with the the Punk and Orton deal at Survivor Series. So it is a way to get people really jazzed about your show if you give them two big holy bleep 
moments and returns or debuts on the same night. So, yeah, something something to keep in mind, and we'll uh, we'll see what Tony's big announcement is next week, I guess. So the AEW rankings also came back this week. <laughs> Tony Khan released them after Dynamite. Uh, rather than each specific title having a list of contenders, um, he did do that for the tag and the trios divisions. But as far as breaking down, he just has a list of the top five men's contenders and the top five women's contenders and not like specifically X person is the number one contender for the world title or for the TBS title or whatever the case may be. So your, uh, your, your men's champions are Samoa Joe, Christian Cage, Orange Cassidy, and Eddie Kingston. The big four. The, uh, the contenders, Swerve Strickland, number one. All right. Hangman Page, number two. Sure. Those two are going to be wrestling next week for a title shot at the pay-per-view. Makes sense. Uh, Adam Copeland, number three. Sure. Guys won a lot. And, uh, I'm sure he's going to wrestle Christian again. <laughs> sure, why not? John Moxley, number four. Moxley, uh, Moxley lost to Eddie Kingston, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, in the, uh, in the finals of the, uh, the Continental Classic, right? Uh, he did, correct? Yeah. I mean, he's won a couple matches in a row since then against like Shane Taylor and Lee Moriarty and now Jeff Hardy. Anyway. Mm-hmm. You could justify it. Number five, Roddy Strong. Um, okay, whatever. Like, this isn't the worst list I've ever seen. Sure. Women's contenders, Deanna Perrazzo. She's been in the company two weeks. She's number one. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Whatever. Thunder Rosa, number two. Thunder, I think, has won maybe two singles matches since she come, since uh, she came back. Hikaru Shida, number three. Mm-hmm. If I were Shida, I'd be pissed. <laughs> I got to be ahead of Thunder Rosa. Number four, Sky Blue. Um, All right. She was wrestling every week on TV there for a while. I feel like I haven't seen her in a little bit, but okay. Number five, Mariah May. Also been in the in the company for a cup of coffee. And has beaten Queen Amadonna and Vice Amin- Lady. What's her Aminata name? and Lady yeah. Frost. Lady yes. Frost. <laughs> Mr. Freeze. I was going to say Ice Woman, but that didn't sound right. <laughs> Lady Freeze. <laughs> Mrs. Freeze, Dr. Freeze, Nora Uh, Freeze. Correct. Yes. But uh, interesting. Um, So my thought is here, if you go with the idea that, okay, it's a new year and everybody's win loss records reset. Sure. You can probably make this case that all of the people in these various rankings, I don't know how the dark order and the trios rankings, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, But Okay, all of those people have won on television at least once or twice and or are in programs with the champion of a, of one of the four cha- male champions or whatever. Yeah. But then it's like Thunder Rose is there. Okay, she has two wins, but she's number two, I assume because she never lost the title. I guess. But that was two years ago. Yes. And if everything resets at the start of the new year yeah, and there's no automatic rematches for losing a belt, then seems like she should be lower or, you know, that Sheeta and Mariah May, for that matter, would have equal claim to to her spot. Um, yeah, it's odd. It's definitely odd. Okay, but it's early in the year, so yeah. whatever. Those, those lists aren't the worst I've ever seen. Tag team champions are Ricky Starks and Big Bill, Tedder Sting and Darby Allen, number one. Okay, they've uh, never lost a match as a team. Sure. You can uh, you can justify that. John Silver and Alex Reynolds, number two. They've uh they've beaten uh uh Brandon Cutler and Colt Cabana around the horn uh over the last six months. Uh in a lot of dark matches. Uh they haven't had a televised win since like September or something. Uh so okay, but hey, new year, new me, right? Sure. So we can we can maybe justify that. New year, new me, dumbass, as Hangman <laughs> Page recently said. Yes. Danielson and Castagnoli are number three. What? <laughs> I mean, I guess they beat uh, Ed, Ed Kingston and uh, whoever Ed Kingston teamed with on Collision the other week. Ortiz, I believe. Yeah. All right. So they have one win as a team this year. Okay. Sure. It's uh, it's only a month. All right. Private Party number four. Uh. 
Okay. <laughs> they beat Top Flight in their return match. And then, uh, spoiler alert, on Rampage this week, uh, they 50-50 them. Ah. <laughs> Top Flight beat Private Party this week. Oh, all right, then. <laughs> well, as of yeah. the timeline of the rankings coming out, I guess that yeah. technically could make sense. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta, number five. Have these guys ever had a two-on-two <laughs> tag team match? Um... I mean, you would have to think <laughs> so based on them being in the top five tag team. <laughs> but like, I feel like nothing jumps out, right? <laughs> no, I feel like yeah, I feel like there was a match like a like a maybe it was like a six man with them and Rocky recently. I feel like that was on a yeah on a dynamite, but or a rampage or something. But yeah, I don't, I can't think of a Orange and Trent <laughs> tag team victory that occurred recently, unless they wrestled the Kingdom or somebody on ring of honor television or something that i'm not aware of that famous tag team orange cassidy and trent beretta like i know what? i know i know chuck is hurt right so i guess but wouldn't wouldn't that's trent, a shame. wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't trent and rocky be the tag team then i know rocky's not like a full-time right. wrestler but he's on the show every other week so yeah I don't know, man. That one doesn't make a lot of sense, but whatever. It's the number five contenders, I guess. Sure. Trio's champions are the acclaimed and daddy ass Billy Gunn. And uh, the number one contenders are Bullet Club Gold, the other half of the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. <laughs> um, okay. I, ge- I, I guess that's fine. They're so the that, R- that's fun. The ROH six man titles get you <laughs> the number one contendership for the oh, uh... Lord. <laughs> the AW Treehouse title. Yeah, I guess. Well, those two. I guess those two teams are in the program together. Then, but then they're going to turn. One's going to turn on the other. Sure. So uh, the acclaimed and um, Mr. Ass are idiots for letting the Bang Bang Scissor Gang into their club. Yeah, you have to kind of almost do the double swerve, where like they've known the whole time and they like catch them in the act, right? Because otherwise, make... them. right. Because otherwise you make these guys look like the biggest idiots of all time, which I mean, they're the acclaimed. They they can do a lot of comedy and silly stuff. So maybe it doesn't matter if you make these guys look like idiots, but I still wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, the Hardys and Mark Briscoe are number two. I think they've won one trios match together, <laughs> but it is a new year. Sure. The Rampage crew, uh, Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, and Mark Briscoe. Mm-hmm. Also, Matt Hardy and Jeff Hardy are turning heel, and it's unlikely that they will be teaming with Mark Briscoe <laughs> going forward. The Dark Order are number three. What? <laughs> I assume this is Reynolds, Silver, and Uno, because who else is in the group anymore? I think, I think it's just the them. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the group. Because they... Uh, Stu, Stu came back and then disappeared again. Yeah, Stu, Stu resigned, disappeared, but is doing his own thing. Not part of the group, even though Evil Uno doesn't have a prayer without him. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, I I don't know. Okay, then number four and number five are the number one, and number two featured teams on Collision every week: FTR and Daniel Garcia and the House of Black. Sure, why not? <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> is this a point where we can slide in the uh, the House of Black don't do no jobs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. So FTR Danny Garcia beat House of Black in an elimination escape the cage match on Collision this past week, uh, only because Malachi Black was an idiot and had the match won <laughs> and then decided to get back in the cage. He had the cage door open and was about to walk out the steps and then decided to get back in the ring and beat Daniel Garcia some more. And it backfired and Garcia won. Uh, but uh, uh, Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez on their uh, Wrestling Observer Radio were saying, you know, nobody in this match, uh, there's a lot of people in AEW that don't like doing jobs. And here's what we know. We know we know FTR will do jobs. And I'm like, will they? But I, I guess. <laughs> I, not, to, I, not to the Young Bucks, but I guess. I, I guess whatever. It's beside the, it's besides sure. the point. Sure. D- Daniel Garcia loses every other week. So, mm-hmm. I mean, he's won a couple in a row now, I think. But um, Garcia is, like, obviously, he's not a no-jobs guy. Right. So, and then on the other side, you got the House of Black. And um, 
Buddy Matthews has done a couple jobs this year in tags, I think. And um, Malachi Black has had like one singles match in the company in the last two years. <laughs> and Brody King uh, almost, he just did the Continental Classic where he did some jobs. But uh, so then the House of Black got very mad online about this. And we're saying, hey, look, don't blame us because they advertised this match one way and then they started advertising it a different way. It's like this was always escape the cage. (laughs) Nobody's doing any jobs (laughs) without which is true, I suppose, because then like Will Washington and people that work for the company were like, yeah, hey, look, don't put this on them. We just tried to clarify what we meant when we started advertising this match some more. Uh, but the root of all this is House of Black, at no point did they ever say, hey, look, we love doing jobs. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do jobs for anybody, anywhere, anytime. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dave's all, overall point in this was, look, two of the three guys in House of Black, Buddy Matthews and Malachi Black, are going back to WWE as soon as they can. <laughs> This yeah. is this is we know that Malachi tried to get out of tried to get out of his contract once before, mm-hmm. and um, may have gotten a release granted, but the release was you're gonna sit at home for the, <laughs> for the length of what your deal would have been. So then all of a sudden he came back to work. Mm-hmm. So that he wasn't he wasn't getting a you can go back to WWE release. Right. He was going to get a you can sit at home for three years uh, 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 release. So then he came back to work. Buddy Matthews, I don't know what his deal was, but we know he was the <laughs> WWE Hall of Fame last year. Uh, we know that his girlfriend is the most push woman in WWE and Rhea Ripley. Mm-hmm. And uh, Brody King, I don't know anything about him. Uh, so very good friends go. with CM Punk. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Not, yeah. Anyway, uh, those those two teams have had some good matches on Collision absolutely. in the last few weeks. I liked and, the cage match for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, whatever. The ex- escape the cage rules are stupid, though. They've always been dumb. They're especially dumb in a company that has historically treated the cage match pretty well. I guess. Um. But let me. Yeah. So my only thought on this is. I think the only person who directly commented on the no jobs thing was Buddy uh, Matthews posted a picture of his win loss record, and he's like, zero oh, and two in singles matches and one and two in trios matches this year. Sure. So that was his way of saying that. But that again is not a direct, as you said, it's not. Hey, I'll job to anyone anytime. All you got to do is ask type of thing. Right. And also, as we discussed off the air. Not everyone. You can make it known to your boss and your fellow wrestlers that you don't want to do no jobs without being 1997 Shawn Michaels <laughs> and announcing I will not be doing any jobs. <laughs> like there's other ways to make it known and to, you know, for lack of a better term, not saying that's what anyone's done here, but to politic or to argue your case of Out. why you don't think it's... <laughs> pouting is also a way <laughs> why you don't think it's the right time for you to be beaten yeah uh without literally going i refuse to do any jobs to anyone so i think there's a lot of splitting hairs going on and to your point they didn't even outright deny <laughs> the de- the very flippant version that dave and brian talked about about like these guys don't want to do jobs right so They didn't really even outright deny that claim. And even if they did, there's other ways to make it known to your boss and to your, to the rest of the locker room that you're going to raise a stink. If, if you get asked, we've talked kind of in broader terms over the last year with guys like Andrade Mm -hmm. and Miro as well. (laughs) Somehow it's like, 1989 NWA in that company (laughs) where nobody wants to do jobs and they somehow no one will make them do a job. Yep. (laughs) Like like, Andrade, they 
Andrade and Miro, they just sent him home. Yeah. <laughs> Miro was home for like a year. <laughs> you don't want to do any jobs? All right. Well, see you later. <laughs> I'll show you. What? <laughs> I'll pay you a bunch of money to sit at home. What? And then I'll hire your wife. <laughs> That'll learn you. Oh man, what a weird it is so weird. And it's 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 noticeable like on a week like Dynamite this week, which as we noted was not a marquee show. It was all about setting up next week's show, but it's like your your big your three big singles matches were Hangman Page versus Toa Leona. Yeah. Uh God bless the guy. I thought it was a good match, but everybody knew what the finish was. <laughs> There, totally there, was, there was some wonky stuff in there too. Yeah. Uh totally on a, not a singles wrestler, has never no. had a singles match, even no. though they're trying to push that he's never been pinned or submitted. Yes. Like, yeah, but I've seen this his trio lose like 18 times. Yes. So what does that mean? Um, but no, no idea. Also, maybe you could have mentioned that before this week if you wanted that to mean anything. Sure. But it's like, okay, so you have Hangman wrestling him. You need someone for, for Hangman to beat. You pick him, guy. At least he swerves guy, right? Yeah, it makes can sense. kind of make sense that he, you know, he called on his his big beefy bodyguard. Right. All right, that's fine. Main event, Rob Van Dam wrestles Swerve, and they have a hardcore match. It was a fun-ish match. I, totally fine for what it was. Yep. Rob, and they, and they don't overuse Rob. He kind of only comes in to lose. <laughs> But he, he's won his tag matches and he's lost the singles matches, right. which is a fine use of Rob Van Dam to, you know, sporadically use this guy. And they, yeah. And they've used him five times in six months. So. Right. Totally fine. Yeah. And that so I don't really have a, a huge problem with either of those, but it does highlight that there's nobody in this like weird homogenous upper middle car of the card that apparently would agree to lose to Hangman Page or Swerve who are both going for the world championship. And then the other singles match on the show was John Moxley and Jeff Hardy, who who will let anyone beat him. Yes. But as a result, they put him on TV to lose all the time, and it doesn't mean anything to beat Jeff Hardy. Correct. So like you've created this world where you have like your 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 upper middle of the card where you should have guys a lot of those guys should be doing jobs for the guys that are going up the card to face the champions won't do jobs and so you're left with like brian cage and jeff hardy and those types of guys to do all the jobs for everybody (laughs) yes and then your young guys like dante martin and lee moriarty yes it's like it's a there's too much star power on this show <laughs> for Hangman Page to have had to wrestle a tag guy in his match that's supposed to be he's being set up to lose. <laughs> yeah. And hey man, you go back like a year, Hangman was beating Moxley in the Texas Death Match. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, well, maybe this made sense a year ago. Um, maybe we should have pulled the trigger on Hangman then instead of then having him go home for three months at a time and then come back and 50 50 with swerve. It's like, yeah. at least those two guys are 50 50 with each other. That's fine. But to your point, I agree that it would be more ideal for each of them to have a guy to beat. And I'm not specifically saying Moxley because Moxley shouldn't be doing a lot of jobs. Sure. Right. But s- maybe Danielson and Castagnoli. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like s- guys at that level that are not factored in uh, in a marquee singles match this pay-per-view cycle, you would maybe have those guys ready to beat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Like, it's... <laughs> right, there's no reason that you couldn't do... You couldn't do Aleister Black and Hangman. And right. uh, except for... <laughs> Except for no one jobs. glaring, obviously, <laughs> uh, reason as to why you wouldn't do a match like that. So no jobs. Yeah. Uh, same with Miro or or anybody like that. It's like yeah, theoretically, that's what those guys. If you're not in a big match on the pay per view, your job should be to get the guys who are ready. But that's very clearly not the mentality that is uh, permeating that AEW locker room these days. I, I guess I should I shouldn't have included Danielson there because I think Danielson and Kingston. Is looking like it's a match, sure. but you get the point. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> like like Castagnoli. Oh yeah, Claudio for sure is a guy who should probably he did 
job to hangman recently but yeah that's true um but yeah he's he's probably a guy that could be factored into more singles matches but <sighs> it's just yeah it's, it just made the show and like again i don't i don't think i didn't think dynamite was a bad show but it was severely lacking in star versus star matches and for better or worse that is what wrestling television has been for like 35 years now <laughs> Like you can't you can't wind the clock back on that, so it ends up being a pretty, you know, it feels like a very ho hum show by the end because okay, I saw a, a bunch of singles matches, some of which were good, where there was never one second <laughs> where the finish was in doubt. So you're just kind of sitting there waiting for the match to end to see what they do after. Yeah. So in uh, viewership this week, Dynamite was about average as to what it's been doing over the last 10 weeks. So for the last 10 weeks, they've been averaging a 0.28 in 1849. This year, uh, this week, they did a 0.26. And they've been averaging 832,000 viewers for the last 10 weeks. And they did 818. So they were a tick down from the numbers from last week, which were <laughs> Adam, Adam Copeland has done it again. Uh, Adam Copeland and Minoru Suzuki in the main event. Uh, n- nobody, nobody wanted to see it. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, only sickos wanted to see it and enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know what. I don't think you could take anything away from that. These, the show did fine. Like it, it didn't light the world on fire, but it did fine. Yeah. So again, maybe, maybe that's why. Tony feels like it's not as big of an issue as it appears to be <laughs> to you and I who watch these shows every week. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's like, okay, you bring in Suzuki or, I mean, they brought in, uh, you know, Nagata to, to do a job to Danielson. Again, at least you can go, well, he's been the triple crown champion in all Japan. And so you can, you can say that he, him beating him is a step towards him beating Eddie. At least there's a reason to bring in a guy to lose in that case. But and we're and plus we're just doing Danielson bucket list matches at this point. Correct. <laughs> Which is the I'm pretty sure the main reason all the CLO guys are here now. Right. Brian can't go to Arena Mexico, so we're gonna bring Arena Mexico to him. hmm So uh which is fine. It'll make for it'll make for fun television. But yeah, there is with all of the people they have contracted currently Sure feels like you could see more uh, people of note losing a match here or there, and it wouldn't be the end of the world. But, you know, <laughs> that's just me. All right. Well, we, uh, we've gone through a lot here today. We've been talking for an awfully long time. Uh, is there any, <laughs> anything else that you'd like to talk about? No, I think that. Oh, well, you, you got to talk about the oh. Sasha Stan uh, group. Okay. Chat, yeah. All right. So there's a Sasha Stan, uh, a Mercedes money. as uh, group chat and um her she doesn't really have a uh, like a social media person but there's a fan that is like the admin for this for this chat and occasionally she will drop in and be part of the chat so last week uh, um and I know I'm in this group chat, right? So last week, uh, I saw screenshots on social media of people asking her what she was up to and her saying, I'm training with uh, Tyler Breeze and Bailey at, uh, at Breeze's school. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, well, that makes sense. Why did I not see this? And then I went in a, into the group chat and I was, oh, okay, well, I left the group chat. <laughs> Why did I leave the group chat? So I rejoined the group chat and that set off a frenzy, right? So <laughs> when someone leaves or joins the chat, you get the notification. This is on Instagram, by the way. Uh, you get the you get the notification. Hey, so and so has has left the chat. So and so has joined the chat. So then there's a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of uh oh, Ethan's here. Who is Ethan? 
is a, Ethan is a wrestling dirt sheet guy. <laughs> Ethan is a wrestling tea reporter. <laughs> it's like, who the f is Ethan? <laughs> and then these these stands are like tr- cutting voice memo promos on me, <laughs> saying this is a this chat is supposed to be a safe space for Mercedes. It's not a place for wrestling tea and not a place for no dirt sheet people mm. and everybody's just ripping on me and then uh the v- well-known sasha stand danny speaks mm-hmm. up and says no man ethan's crew he's cool <laughs> he's crew. of course he's crew uh, of course the 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 group of sasha fans are is it's always been the sasha crew right k-r-e-w oh you don't have to tell me <laughs> right so it's always been you know so he's like no he's crew he uh he went to japan for her debut and it's like how does this guy who i don't know <laughs> i don't follow on social media he knows my whole life story mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like well i do consider myself crew mm-hmm. i did go to japan for her debut how did he know anyway? So then people are like my narrative for my relationship with the Mercedes slash Sasha stands has always been we get along. I'm not one of them, but we have like a truce. Mm-hmm. And that was like the narrative that I had made up in my head. And then I got in that group chat and it turns out that's exactly what it was. In fact, it is not made up. It's like there are well-known people, well-known stands in the community who know who I am, and we maintain the peace with one another. But I probably shouldn't be in the group chat. And, um, yeah. So there's that. So then, once I got in the group chat, I immediately remembered why I muted and/or left the group chat in the past because it's one hundred. Uh, of Mercedes' biggest fans going back and forth with each other, and then occasionally, like uh, someone with autism chimes in with "Hello, Mercedes, you are my favorite." <laughs> so, who is Ethan? And people cutting voice memo promos on me in the Sasha Stan group chat. This was going on, I think, last Thursday night. It was, I was having a ball. It was hilarious. <laughs> I will mention. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to reveal that I may have stooged you off. Uh oh. But Danny does follow the podcast account. Okay. We're mutuals. So we don't interact a ton, but sure. Um, we are mutuals, and I. I think when I think I've I've certainly retweeted the picture of you and Mercedes, <laughs> uh, several times. Uh, whenever you have posted it, so. <laughs> Yeah, I do see to post it a lot. I'd also like to uh uh I'm going to uh Becky Lynch's book tour when she's coming to uh oh. Washington DC next month. At least you don't have to go to like New Jersey for it or something. Yes, correct. Uh so she's going on an, an honest to god book tour. Mm-hmm. And uh yeah, that's cool. Anyway, all right, so that's uh me and uh all of my uh problematic fandom this week. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, I read that. I, <laughs> I read, uh, or I saw Becky saying she she wrote this by herself. She didn't have a, a ghostwriter. That's the story. Yeah, well, I believe awesome. it. Like, I mean, you you're gonna have. I think she wrote a draft, and she had she had Mick Foley look it over, and Mick was like, "All right, we're gonna punch this up a little bit. Uh, you should emphasize these parts of your story to make it more of an underdog story." and de-emphasize these parts of it mm-hmm. and uh mick had several new york times bestsellers so um probably good advice yeah yeah so there you go all right well that book comes out on march 26th is it is it a wwe release or is it did she go with another publisher it is an honest to god publisher uh, I'm sure WW. It's under WWE's auspices, though. I, I guess think it would it's... have to be because it says Becky Lynch on it, right? Correct. Yes, it, but she does have a real name on it too. 
Alright, I can't figure out how to publish it. But yeah, it's under the auspices of WWE. Okay, good times, everybody. Well, until next time, I'm Liam. I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the rest of my life. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. The longest episode ever. Uh, yeah, we're in the we're in the ballpark. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. It's okay. <laughs> I'm on the book website now, and somehow I can't figure out who published it. Oh. I think it's Penguin or somebody though. Oh, okay, that's like one of the only ones left, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, not to derail your your book research, but did you see the Orioles trade that happened while we were recording? No, I didn't. Uh, Milwaukee receives D.L. Hall, Joey Ortiz, and a 2024 draft pick for Cor- Corbin Burns. Whoa! Big giving point. up, giving up D.L. Hall is uh, well at this point he's a high leverage left hander reliever. So like I don't like, I think he's Josh Hader. So I think yeah. I think giving him up is 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 problematic. But uh, Corbin Burns is legit. Yeah, I mean, you needed, you needed to do something. <laughs> yeah. Um. Hey, and uh, and that Cal is... Ripken Jr. bought the Orioles this That's week. That's right. He is now the sole owner. So you're doing shtick about how everyone in Maryland, uh, of you know, who listens to the sports talk radio station, mm-hmm. thinks that uh, Cal. But what are you basing this on? I don't know. Just the shtick I'm doing. <laughs> Okay. I just imagine they're going to hear that Cal Ripken is one of the names and they're just going to jump to Cal Ripken bought the Orioles. <laughs> and I think that, I don't know. I just think that's a funny, I just think that's a funny shtick. <laughs> it is funny. I'm not, I'm not and just also, telling it. I would say based on the years of people who would just unprompted say that Cal Ripken should buy the Orioles. <laughs> Yes. With a gross misunderstanding of how much money it costs to buy a <laughs> professional sports team and how much money Cal Ripken has and how right. his, and whatever money he had was halved you know, when 10 he got years, divorced. Right. Ten years right. ago when he got divorced. Right. Uh, and so but, I just imagine they're just going to go, well, see, I told you Cal should buy the team. And that's that's sort of where my that's that's the genesis of it. And that's where I'm uh, that's where I've I've chosen to lay my hat. It's not bad. It's not bad shtick. Uh, I was just wondering. And uh, yeah, Cal Ripken, like the most he ever made in a season was like $8 million. Yeah. And if you like his career baseball earnings are probably like $45 million or something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and he had a lot of endorsements for a long time. But it was also more like the kind of endorsements where you get like a free Chevy truck <laughs> And like Nike sends you free shoes than it was. Right. They give you a hundred million dollars, like a, Le- a LeBron James endorsement. Right. right. Like, yeah. He came up in the wrong era for that. Right. It's like Bryce Harper yeah. has a shoe or a cleat or whatever. Right. Like exactly. every, like he would have gotten, he would have been a much richer man had he, you know, played 10 years later, but yeah. Yep. 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 I try to keep on keeping on.